board. You're probably have to go next. Well, hi everybody. Uh, glad that you joined us today. I'm here with uh, with Greg Kanake, the executive director of the Care Center of Loveland. Greg also happens to be a good friend of mine, so it's a it's a little bit of a conversation amongst friends. But one thing I'd I'd like to say as we get rolling, you know, we do lots of stuff around the world. Trauma Free World does. One thing that we love to do is to to connect with and partner with folks who are doing work right here in our corporate hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio. And Greg and the Care Center of Loveland are, uh, uh, Greg, you call it a, a middle class, upper middle class community in, in greater Cincinnati, right? Yeah, absolutely. Suburb of Cincinnati. Tell us a little bit, just before we jump in, tell us a little of the demographics of Loveland. So people kind of get a, you know, a, a picture of that. Yeah, Loveland's a very interesting community, um, obviously a smaller community from that standpoint, but in Northeast Cincinnati, and um, it is an affluent community for sure. Um, you know, people middle class, upper middle class, but there actually is a growing number of people who live in the Loveland area that are under-resourced as well. And in Loveland, that's a big surprise for people who actually live here. There are people who've lived here for the past 20 years who didn't know that there was somebody who was living in poverty literally right next door to them because all of those communities are hidden behind the trees um, here in the, the suburbs. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, I don't know if it's true everywhere in the world, but certainly in the United States, probably in other uh, you know, developed countries, um, this gentrification of the urban center of the urban core is now pushing people to the suburbs. Would you say that's right? Per people who we would normally think of uh, marginalized or working poor folks in, in the urban core are now, as you said, moving to the suburbs. Is that what you're seeing happen in Loveland? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's been a pretty significant growth over the last 10 years. So we've seen um, in Loveland specifically, if you would use the number of kids on free and reduced lunches as a, as a measure of that, we've seen that number grow 100% over the last 10 years to the point where right now, 15% of the kids in Loveland specifically are on free and reduced lunch. But that's not just a Loveland conversation. That's really a whole outer ring um, suburban Cincinnati conversation that's happening. Another community we serve is Milford. And so they've also seen 100% growth in that number where mm. now 25% of the kids there are on free and reduced lunch. Um, Kings is another to the north of us has also seen that 100% growth. Um, and then the Goshen community um, hasn't seen 100% growth, but over 50% of the kids there are on free and reduced lunch. And so, yeah, if I, if I had a care center family here, I could you know, introduce you to a mom. Her name is Hope, and one of her son's names is Derek. They moved here for a couple of different reasons um, to the suburbs specifically. Um, and that could be, you know, it's a much safer community than maybe a community that Hope lived in before, or there's potential job opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe she perceived here a better school system. Lots of different reasons that she moved here, but really at the core is she wants a better life for her and for her family. And so more and more of those families are moving out to the suburbs, but that definitely creates some challenges as well for um, communities like this. Yeah, interesting. Uh, for folks who might not be in the States, free and reduced lunch is a measurement that, that the governments use in the United States to kind of, uh, to, to not kind of, to show the, the population who are receiving benefits from the government. Right, specific benefits, and so public schools give free and reduced lunch uh, to to students, where students who don't have that need are paying for their lunch. So it's a it's a government measurement, right, of 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 um, kind of at risk students in their school population. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and so what's so interesting? You said twenty years ago, a community like Loveland would not be this is this would not be news, right? Their population of of kids in their school or their next door neighbor living in poverty wasn't really much of a reality for a community like Loveland. But now, with this this movement of folks to the suburbs for all the reasons you just laid out, is causing a little bit of a a little bit of um, I don't I don't know if would you call it angst? Would you call it anxiety? Would you what would you call it? The, Communities and churches are trying to figure out how to how to deal with this shifting demographic. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. And that's one of the biggest challenges because as families have moved out, resources haven't really followed them out to the suburbs just yet. And so um, all of those kind of core resources would be available to people that lived in more of an urban context because they're all basically housed in downtown Cincinnati or fairly close to downtown Cincinnati. And one of the challenges that we see here locally too is um, as those resources are there, it's very difficult to get to them um, because we have no public transportation. A family like Hopes is really reliant on a vehicle and where she may not have a vehicle, have shaky transportation, it really creates some challenges just to be able to access those kinds of those kinds of resources. So that makes something like the care center very critical here in our community based on the work that we're trying to do to help people remove barriers and build resources to be able to thrive in life. Um, because as a family like Hopes too is just engaging in more relief related resources, like some of the challenges she starts to face is she moved here to get to a better place in life, but she's beginning to wonder, does she really have what it takes to be able to do that? And even more so, she's run, wondering, does anybody really care to help her do yeah. that specifically? So it really creates some unique opportunities and challenges in this particular context, just where resources are and how available they are and what are they really there to do. Yeah, such a unique thing, right? And this is not just Cincinnati. This is, again, this is true around the United States, right? It's, oh, absolutely. it's not just a Cincinnati thing. Right. And so communities yeah. are beginning. I, I really liked what you you said there, Greg, this idea, just as simple as the infrastructure around transportation, for example. Right. Someone who has a job in the urban core, there's public transportation to get to and from that job. But mm -hmm. suburbs are really not built for that. And so personal mm -hmm. transportation is a requirement. But along with that comes a lot of costs, a lot of responsibilities that perhaps the clients you're serving don't have access to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just the cost of owning a car, I mean, it's obviously more than putting gas in it. There's got to be, you know, what happens when there's a fix that needs to be, that needs to take place and insurance and registration, all those pieces sometimes makes owning a car actually unaffordable for somebody who's living um, in poverty in the suburbs. Yeah, one reason I was really looking forward to talking to you, Greg, is, is I know that as people watch this, I'm hoping that light bulbs begin to go off a little bit and that, that your story of the Care Center of Loveland, a uh, hope story uh, as, one of your, as one of your clients, um, they'll begin to perhaps see in their own neighborhood, especially if they're not in the urban core, but maybe even they are, they begin to see in their own neighborhood the reality of this, of this shift and the importance of of places, organizations like the Care Center mm -hmm. of Loveland. If you were, if you were talking, let, let's say I didn't know anything about it, and compared to you, I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. What, what, how, what do you say to somebody like me who lives in a community like Loveland? What do you say to somebody like me to to begin to scratch their like, how can I be helpful, or what do I need to know? Yeah, I think first and foremost is this is not some crazy invention that we came up with. We're really trying to tap into some best practice to your point that exists around the country. It exists here in Cincinnati and in several other cities based on the idea of what can we do to bring as many resources that are going to speak to somebody's physical and emotional and educational and relational and for us, even their spiritual health together under one roof, integrate them together and then help families like Hope develop an action plan for how they access that and how they put it into practice in their everyday life. So um, we're really tapping into that best practice and the importance of just bringing those resources together, again, if for nothing more than the transportation piece, but also from the standpoint of, you know, we're whole people, we have needs in different areas and all of those different aspects of life have to be working pretty well together. Those are the pillars on which I would say the opportunity to thrive is built upon. Mm. Trying to make those accessible but integrated together um, is really, really important for those families because, again, we're whole people and we need all kinds of different resources working together. Um, but in the same, there are great resources around our city. So that other half of our best practices, we're not gonna go reproduce the wheel. We have a very high value for partnering with other organizations 
So case in point, an organization like Cincinnati Works has been at work in helping people overcome barriers to employment for over 20 years. Makes no sense for us to go create our own job readiness program. So we're really trying yeah. to space here and provide the resources needed to have Cincinnati Works bring all of the resources out to people in the Northeast part of the city. Because again, as great as that program is, it's in downtown Cincinnati and the likelihood that somebody who lives in Loveland or Goshen or Milford to be able to connect into that, there's gonna be some barriers, not only navigating transportation, but where do I park? You know, what, where, where are my kids gonna stay? Yeah. I'm down there for a half a day trying to engage. So connecting with as many like-minded organizations that really catch that value of let's work together and let's do that in an opportunity to integrate resources together is really, really important to us. Um, again, we don't want to recreate the wheel. We'd rather create opportunity for those resources to come out to people in this part of the city. Yeah, and that, you teed me up great for the next thought, right? <laughs> which is we're, we're glad and, and honored to be part of your uh, group of of organizations and tools to help you serve your clients best. So we do that obviously through the through the realm of trauma training. Tell us a little bit about why even trauma training? Why does this even resonate with you as something that your team, your volunteers need? Oh yeah, I, for us, it's been transformational to have you as a partner because we realize whether it's children or adults and having now been exposed to that training as I was sitting through it, I'm like, wow, this is in the context of children, but I see the exact same thing happening with adults. And we know um, just from, again, best practice research that somebody who lives in poverty is experiencing trauma from the sheer fact that they're under-resourced. And so um, rather than just have an understanding of that, we wanna figure out what can we do to better serve those families if we're gonna help somebody thrive, then we need to help people overcome barriers. And I'm really beginning to believe that trauma is the barrier that just manifests itself in several different ways in the lives of families that we have um, and that we get a chance to meet. And so having some tools to be able to overcome that and help people overcome that becomes really, really, really critical for the work that we're gonna do. Um, because yeah, if somebody's not able to and is not in a place where they can take the information or take the resources that we're providing, surely because of trauma, then we're just gonna be spinning our wheels. So that makes something, an organization like Trauma Free World and the training that you have is just critical to the relationships. We're all about relationship. And so if we're gonna live in healthy relationships, I feel like this is such an important piece of what we need to have an understanding of. But we also need to have tools to know how to help people process through that and us deal with our own trauma as well. Well, that's an interesting point. You know, again, not just for your clients, but many of the folks that, that you work with. I know for some of the work we do, for instance, with Boys and Girls Club, a lot of, and other inner city um, uh, uh, um, uh, organizations, the folks that they bring in to volunteer, sometimes even on their staff, have an experience of trauma themselves. And so what you're saying is that, that the training is not just for your clients, but it also has been uh, eye-opening for your volunteers and even your staff. Yeah, absolutely. I think because we're working with so many different organizations and we have our own internal team as well, I mean, that becomes critical for us to be able to better um, deliver the resources that we're all here to do. So I think having that opportunity of a better understanding of how that impacts us as teams is, is just as important as well. Mm -hmm. Well, Greg, tell us a little bit. I, I hope again that people have, have gotten a little light bulb that goes off and I appreciate the, the time you've spent with us. How can people find Care Center of Loveland? Yeah, we have a website. You can go to carecenterinfo.com and you'll see the different programs um, that we offer. Uh, we are a volunteer driven organization as well. So um, we need, and it might sound like we need an army of people. We actually do need an army of people to be, <laughs> we're going to help people we get actually back do. to work and yeah, build life skills and get unstuck in life through one-on-one -on -one mentoring and coaching. Um, having people engaged there is, is definitely an important piece. So yeah, if you live in the Cincinnati area, um, whether it's a one-time serve or engaging in a one-on-one -on -one relationship, we have opportunities. We'd love to help people find their sweet spot on um, how they can volunteer there. Um, 
as well as we are, the work that we do is driven from donations from people who are passionate about seeing people advance um, here locally. So we'd love to have people consider the care center as an opportunity um, from that standpoint as well. Cause we just wanna see, we wanna work together and we wanna see more and more people thrive in life. That's what we're here to do. And that's our, that's our goal. So it takes us all working together here um, to be able to do that. Uh, I love that. I'd add one other segment of people, and that might be people who have a heart for this, and they don't have something like this in their neighborhood, right? There's there's lots of cities who have services like this in their urban core, but plenty of people are wondering, hey, I do realize I have uh, neighbors, I have my kids have classmates who I see their struggle to to do exactly what what you're doing. Uh, in, in Loveland. And so I would add to that um, people in other parts of the United States or around the world, if they're interested in how do you overcome that hurdle? I know you've done some great work and are working your tail off, Greg, and your team to, to educate people in more affluent neighborhoods who are now finding themselves with neighbors and friends. And as I said, kids, classmates who, who are now in their, in their schools and their neighborhoods and struggling to to make it to the next level of, of success, perhaps. Um, so I'd invite them to reach out to you as well, so. Oh, that's awesome, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, we're very open-handed with, with any learning that we have and would love to give it away. Yeah, well, thanks, Greg. Greg, I really appreciate it. Love the work you're doing, love to call you a friend, and uh, I look forward to us connecting uh, off air here sometime soon as well. Keep up the great work. Thanks, always great to connect. All right. Thanks, Greg. See ya. Thanks.